Hi guys, and welcome back to the channel. My name is Justin Leppard with Higher Hertz, and today I'm bringing you a cello lesson for the more adventurous among you. We're gonna learn the first popper etude. Now this piece is a little bit complicated. You have to do string crossings, you have to you know, play high up, and you have to really have an ear for a lot of accidentals or notes that deviate off of the normal note, either a half step up or a half step flat. Those are accidentals. We've talked about those in our video about how to read sheet music. But today I want to talk about the popper etudes. The popper etudes, along with the piatti caprices, are among the most famous slash infamous pieces of repertoire in the popular etude sort of world. So etude is actually a French word that means to study. And so that's where we get the word etude. It's a study. It's sort of something in between scales and a piece of music. Um, something that's musical, but definitely teaches you certain techniques. Now, the thing about the popper etudes is they are sort of infamous for sort of pressing the limits of technical virtuosity. And they were composed by David Popper. Uh, he was a cellist. He was a, a pretty big cellist about you know 120 years ago, around the turn of the 20th century. And his most enduring legacy is that he wrote these. And basically, people like them because they're good compositions. So I want you to probably go to imslp.org in order to find this, but if you're really practicing your scales and you're really practicing your arpeggios and you're practicing up the cello, then the first one is actually an achievable goal for somebody who wants to actually practice an etude for several months and to try to learn it and to really challenge themselves. But I would say if you spend money on the proper etudes before you're ready, then the other 11 are probably gonna be mostly out of reach. I think, you know, if you, there might be a couple of others that are that are somewhat you know reasonable, but they get pretty gnarly. Anyways, in today's lesson, which might go a little bit long because I really do want to cover everything, we're just going to talk about how to play this first piece, uh, sort of what makes it tick, and hopefully you'll start to sort of just get engaged in the A2. So this is one of those lessons uh, for the adventurous or for somebody who wants to see a little further along what's going on. So if we look at this piece, the basic thing we have going on is a bunch of arpeggios. So arpeggios, as we've talked about, are basically chords that are broken up, they're played separately, and in this case, they kind of bounce around a lot. Now there's some scales too, but mostly what we're doing is we're doing a study or an exercise in playing these different chord changes. And there's lots of interesting chord changes that happen, but mostly there's a lot of patterns that happen. So you could reduce, for example, the entire first bar to just be a C major chord. Now while this might not be obvious at first, uh, you can just look at the notes, I'll actually look at the key signature and know that we're in C major, but you can look at the notes and see that they're all in the key of C major, that the lowest note in the bar is C, and you're already likely to know that it's C major. Now what really makes it definitively C major is the way that those notes are used. And a lot of that gets into more advanced theory, but you will start to notice the patterns uh, that make it clear what we're working with. Some things that might throw you off, for example, is that on beats two, three and four, we're not actually on chord tones of C major, either C, E, or G. Instead, we're, we're on different notes, but the pattern overall goes down to C. Now, I've spent a lot of time talking about the first measure, but the piece is very consistent. We're basically just playing arpeggios in various combinations and with various twists thrown in all throughout this. So what we want to do is just start by really dissecting the first measure because a lot of things are going to relate to other measures. For example, in measure two, we have variations of the exact same pattern, except that now we're playing an inverted G major chord. How do I know it's an inverted G major chord? Well, a B is at the bottom, but all the other notes are in the key of C major, and that is going to imply to me that it's a five chord where the third is the bottom. Some of this stuff will become clearer over time, but one exercise you can do is to go through bar by bar and try to figure out what the chords are, especially finding some explanation that makes sense. If you have a teacher to help you, that's gonna help you be accurate, but doing any analysis at all is gonna help your ear and your mind to start feeling what these different chords mean. Now, what we have at the beginning is, it starts with an up bow, and it says, with a very loose wrist at the nut, lightly staccato. So a loose wrist saying at the nut, but I think in this case it might be a little bit more saying just play closer to the nut, uh, slightly staccato. So what he's saying there with the slightly staccato, staccato already only means 
that you don't play the full duration of the note. It doesn't mean it has to be the shortest possible note to begin with. Now he's saying on top of that, lightly staccato. So he wants just the tiniest amount of separation. And he starts it up bow, but if you look at the bottom of the page, he says you could also practice it down bow. And this is, again, this is part of that etude thing where, you know, we see this in the Suzuki books too, some variations on what you're going to be able to do because you want to be able to play a lot of different things. And it feels different to do up down, especially of the string crossing, to, compared to down up. But we're going to start up bow. I'm going to teach it to you, you know, start up bow. And basically, uh, the very first thing we have to do is something that's already kind of difficult, which is jump strings. So when we play this first note, we want to kind of jump the bow up a little bit so it can cross the D string. From there, the, the notes are a little bit more uh, accessible to play. So I was playing a little closer to the frog here. So yeah, so it's okay to kind of use a little bit more bow to kind of be brushy. But I think you're gonna really struggle to get the bounce that you need for this if you are actually at the nut. So that's why I say, I think what he means by that is that he just doesn't want which is gonna be like a heavier sound. He's saying that it's light. He's saying that it's bouncy essentially. And by the lightly staccato, he's saying, again, this is not meant to be, you know, uh, something that's in any way schmaltzy, okay? It's something that's light, it's something that's refined. And so what we want to do is, after we've kind of looked through it, and, and maybe just done a cursory sort of like, okay, I kind of get what the, uh, these first couple chords are, we want to play it slowly. So the way that we're going to want to learn anything is by being able to actually play it and understand it. Training ourselves to play cello is a little bit like training a dog. First you have to get them to do the activity that you want them to do, then you have to get them to associate it with, with a command or a cue. So it's the same for us. We want to know what it is that we're playing before we actually play it. Because as soon as we start to play, we have logged something in our memory as something that's acceptable for us to do because our bodies have already done it. So that's why it's helpful to look through, look at all the notes, look at what they're, you know, look at what the notes are, know what the notes are, think in advance about what the fingerings are. And then when you actually play, start by playing slowly, under tempo. So what we wanna do is basically start by working on the left hand, and then once that's more comfortable, we can really zone in on the right hand and make sure that we're getting that loose wrist, that at the nut, that lightly staccato thing that's marked. So. And this might seem a little extreme um, but, especially if you're newer to the instrument, it's not. And also, when we get later in the piece, that will actually seem fast <laughs> if you are still learning what's going on. So, from here on out, I'm going to move a little bit quicker, because otherwise we'll never get through the piece in this video. But I wanted to show you how you can really overanalyze. It's not really overanalyzing. You can really go super deep, bar by bar, and especially at the beginning, because what that is going to do is it's going to teach you about everything else that's to come. It's the most important bar in a way because it sets what's going on. And especially in a piece like this, which is very pattern based, what we're going to see is we're going to see the same sort of patterns repeat through different chord changes and then a different type of pattern will take us to a different type of pattern. So that's how I'm going to break up the video for the rest of this. Um, there's a big overarching sort of um, uh, structure to this where, you know, the first however many bars are also repeated at the end. So it's got that kind of ABA or light, you know, sonata form. It's, it's taking something, it's developing it, and it's bringing it back. Very, very common classical technique. And, and maybe all the popper etudes actually do that, though I, I had to run through them just to double check that. So very, very common. That's big picture. But smaller picture, we have these different phrases that repeat. So for example, uh, just looking at it, we can see that actually the first five bars are basically the same pattern of having a low note, jumping up to a high note, and then playing your arpeggio. So we have And then we switch to a slightly 
different pattern where um, the pattern compresses uh, and instead of, you know, boom, a whole bar being the pattern, we have kind of half bar patterns. Dun, 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 question and answer and and uh, there are fingerings marked. These are actually David Popper's fingerings, so they're pretty trustworthy. And on top of that, they're the fingerings that he intended. And again, since this is an etude, I think it's important to at least be able to do those fingerings because those are the fingerings that matter. I mean, you could do all of this on the G string if you really wanted to. But you're never really gonna play like that the point of even playing like that is that it is a little bit more like free and melodic and it doesn't really make sense for this light and bouncy stuff, right? So again, just go slowly, follow the fingerings and pay really close attention to what the actual notes are. Because if you start playing the wrong note, you play, you know, a D natural instead of a D sharp or whatever, then you're getting it in your ear wrong. So you wanna be able to hear the pattern. All the patterns in here make sense. So one way or another, if you have a piano, it can be helpful to go and play the notes. It can be helpful just to say what the note name is to yourself. But eventually too, you wanna to know what the relative interval is because knowing you know the major versus minor third feeling is going to be how you're actually going to really be able to relate to this piece beyond what the notes are and to what the harmonies actually are. Because what we have here is basically a chord progression. <laughs> And when we get to this section, it again switches to a sort of haka technique where uh, we're going down in scale. So this becomes a really significant part of what we play with this, uh, sort of a, a note that's higher, that's moving slower, and then notes that are descending downwards. So here's where we have uh, another skip. Here, another skip. Another skip. And it repeats again. That second bar was that sort of chord progression pattern. So now we're starting to mix it up. That's how compositionally he's done it at least. Um, Here it seems like it repeats, but it actually goes on to another type of pattern, which is um, actually really, it's really conveniently the same fingering. So I'll show you the fingering. So it's shift back here, and the fingering is always going to be two, four, one. The four, one being on the higher string, the A string. So do that same fingering, shift up to A. Now we're going to do, so basically that pattern was we moved up a minor third. And we're going to do that again, but first we're going to go down a half step from that first note. So the first one was here. Da, da, da. And then we'll shift up a minor third. And then we'll do the rest of this pattern here. And then here is something that can be really tricky. You have to cross both of the middle strings. do that is you really have to move your arm around so see how I'm doing that you gotta really because you have to switch to how you're playing on the A string so a good way to be able to do that is just to take a little extra time before doing it because what you don't want to have to do is hit the middle strings because that's not clean and it's not what's printed and it's not light and bouncy okay so we're gonna keep going here and then here is where I would say we kind of go into the next section of the piece. And I'm just sort of saying this by feel. You know, here we start to um, go into more of what just feels like a development section because we're just moving through a lot of different chords. So I'll, again, again, the fingerings are in here so you can play through slowly. And so I'm going to keep playing through this. <laughs> And now we have a suction, and again, this is after this is the same fingering, the same pattern. So it's 
basically 4-1, but you, it's printed 3-1, but it's the same interval. It's 1-4, 2, shift down 2. Okay, so what's really nice about that is it's the same exact fingering. We're going to have a pattern later on that's not even the same fingering. And then this fits into a bigger pattern uh, that basically just bumps up a half step each time. So I'll play it, but really listen, I'm moving up a half step each time. So that's the reason for the complicated looking accidentals. But once you start to relate that to the hand positions, you start looking at what those intervals are, and you start hearing what's going on, it actually makes it possible to be able to play it. So let me, I'll start that again and we'll keep going. have to shift up to those notes, it might help first you have to play the note an octave lower so that you can hear it and then practice that shift, but you will get there in the end. I promise you! Alright, so let me move on. We're getting to what is the most difficult section and then we're kind of over the hump. So when I was first trying to practice this for a really long time, where we've gotten to now is about as far as I was able to get. And so remember that if you are working on this, you're going to get something out of it even from those first four measures. No matter how far you get through it, you're going to get something out of it. And what we're about to do next is really tricky, especially when you actually bring this up to tempo, which I, I've still been playing this under tempo. So the next little thing we have is a diminished figure. We're going to go up. Diminished means that every single interval is the same. It's a minor third. It's not the sameness part that it means. It's just the minor third part. A similar chord is an augmented chord, which is every interval is a major third. So and it sounds like this. A diminished sound is minor third, so it sounds like this. And I think at first those can kind of sound kind of similar, but over time the augmented has like a, like a heart reaching out feel. Whereas the diminished has kind of an inward feel. And to me that's the difference. But So we have this little diminished thing. So we went up a minor third, but we're going to play with the same thing. And then we're going to stay in the same position. We're going to be in thumb position, but we're actually playing in G minor now. That's a G minor chord. And then we're going to switch up. So that's what's called a 1, 6, 4, 5, 1 progression because we played uh, the G minor chord, but with the 5. And then we played the five chord of D, D. And then that's what resolves to definitively to G minor, which he has us play. He marks it on the G string. That's what that G means, on the G string. And we're going to be quiet. And we're going to be quiet. And Every time I play this, I want to be able to like crescendo through it just a little bit. Maybe some people have a problem with that, but I kind of like it. And so now it repeats, but it will end differently. So there it changes because we go to the F natural instead of F sharp. And now we're going to do another progression. And basically the scale that we're playing is kind of, uh, you can look at it a few different ways, but I look at it as being a flat nine dominant chord. What I mean by that <laughs> is that what we're, what we're playing is basically that sort of feel. We have this augmented second around the, uh, around the root. So what we have here is uh, we start with E flat and C on the top, and, and nonetheless, we're actually playing over a D minor chord, arguably. And the pattern for this is where it changes a little bit. So you do two, four, one, two, four, and then you have to, uh, so you'll do two, four, one, two, four, shift down two, two, one, and then three, same thing. And then you have to shift back up. 
it's the, the same pattern, and then we're going to do it one final time. And then now we do um, this, now we're back to being able to do the same hand pattern. Just go down a half step. We get down to there, and here's, I just love this part, it just sounds so metal to me. Diminished again. We get that. So here is where I really make that argument that it is about that flat two relationship because we're we're on this G chord, which by the way is a nice pedal chord because we're in the key of C major and G is the five chord of C. A little extra theory for you, but that's kind of what's going on here is that this is really building up that genus because we're about to go back to the A section, the thing that we started off playing. But that's why there's so much emphasis on this G down here. So you can really... Every time we hit that G, it's a lack of a resolution to, to the resolution that we want. Okay. And I think that's also the reason why he does a diminuendo there. A diminuendo is getting quieter because he wants to really build that tension but just make it bum, 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 right afterwards. Okay, so this is the A section we've already played, and it starts to vary when we get down. And it starts to vary when we get down to the two last lines. So before that we have, do you remember when we had to cross two strings at once? <laughs> chord cycle that's going to bring us back to the uh, home. So we start with like a nice C chord, G7, C7, and these are all the same fingerings for those first few, but now we're going to be a little different because we're extending the one, down a half step. This is just C major. Uh, and all of this is just C major. And just that piano note, uh, you know, the way that I just do it is I, I settle into it and I really listen for the intonation of that octave. And keeping my hairs flat on the string. Especially after a whole piece of playing separated, it can be the hardest thing in the world to do that. So it's kind of a surprise trick right at the end there where you have to be able to suddenly pull the bow straight. All right, guys, I thank you so much for making it all the way through this video. That's freaking awesome. And this is a difficult piece, so I hope that you got something out of it and that you're not too hard on yourself if you try to learn it. Like I said, I recommend trying it out first on imslp.org, but if you want to learn all of them, I recommend buying the book so that you have a physical copy that you can practice from and that you're supporting the publishers that still make this possible. But again, it's up to you. I'm not going to advocate for that. But I, I, I will say don't buy the book if you know this is the only one you want to use because it is in public domain. You can find it for free on mslp.org, and if you're just learning this one, you especially should. Now, in any case, I hope that you enjoyed watching this video, and you're enjoying watching all of our videos. I hope your cello learning journey is going really well, and let us know in the comments how it's going and what things can be most helpful. Feedback is one of the most helpful parts of doing this sort of like one to nothing um, sort of teaching relationship, so it really helps out uh, making better videos for you guys. Uh, once again, my name is Justin Leppard with Higher Hertz, and I'm also known as the Vagabond Cellist, here with another cello lesson, and we will be back next week with another one as well. So thank you guys for watching, and we'll see you in the next video.